welcome to Noise 11, Eric McCusker. And I'm, you know, accustomed to saying from Monday Rock, but this time it's a bit different. It's from the Dream Room. Yeah, from the Dream Room. That's right. This is a, a very interesting new band. You've got uh, a, a few other members in there with Nicky Nichols, uh, Rick Petropoulos, and uh, also Fallon Williams. So before we talk about the record, let's talk about the members. I think we'll start with uh, with Fallon because he has uh, a bit of a, a, a classic rock history that dates back with Steve Marriott at one point. Yeah, he played... Um, I mean, Fallon um, is from Chicago in the US and... Um, played for five years with uh, Steve Marriott in, in a sort of a later version of Humble Pie. I think from about maybe 78 to 83 or something he played and even uh, lived, lived in Steve's house in London. And yeah, he said, he said there'd be phone calls in the morning. It'd be, Oh, this is Ron Wood. Could I speak to Stevie? You know, and it's just, it was sort of normal apparently. So, and Stevie Marriott was one of the, uh, the greats. I mean, in Australia, he's better known for being in, um, in the small faces and uh, Tin Soldier and Ichiku Park and those kind of hits, so really uh, one of the one of the greatest singers of all time, I think. Yeah. And Vanetta yeah. Fields, who's a famous backing singer, played uh, in that version with um, with Fallon, that version of Humble Pie, and um, they came out and toured Australia in early eighties, and uh, and I think Fallon fell in love with an Australian girl, as seems to happen quite a lot, and uh, and has been living in Melbourne since. Uh, since the early 80s but he's a, a fantastic drummer and he uh, it was at his studio that we made the record and then uh, rick petropolis of course uh, the ferrets another great melbourne band yeah, yeah the ferrets are fantastic um bill bill miller who was the lead singer in in the ferrets is still around and doing gigs and uh he actually won the APRA award with paul kelly for a song they wrote a couple of years ago so um, um billy's still kicking on and in great shape and uh uh, Rick Petropoulos, I mean, he studied like 12 years of classical piano, but uh, is a wonderful bass player. And, uh, of course, Nicky Nichols. Now, we'll, we'll, we'll try and uh, form some sort of link because she sang on uh, this particular record, uh, John yeah, Farnham, Whispering Jack. Jack, and she sang backing vocals on a song by Mondo Rock you didn't write, not on the uh, one that uh, the song that you did write. On Whispering Jack, yeah, if that all makes sense. I think that's right. Yeah, Nikki can't quite remember, but she thinks that John Farnham did all his own backing harmonies to the song that I wrote, which is a song called No One Comes Close to You. Uh, and uh, Ross wrote uh, A Touch of Paradise and uh, Nikki sang on that. But then Nikki toured with uh, Farnham for a, a number of years and toured with Olivia Newton-John around the world. Uh, in 1991, when Olivia was absolutely at her peak, um, and so and she's she's played with uh, Lulu and um, uh, just an extraordinary number of people who she's sang backup with. But she's always had ambitions to be a lead vocalist and um, and has done a bit of that as well. And uh, so she's the girl singer in the band, and we all this is three of us sing uh, lead vocals at various times on the album. I sing three or four, and Fallon, who's a very good singer, sings three two or three songs on the album too. So yeah, You, of course, Joanna. were with the uh, Captain Matchbox Whoopi band. Did you ever go on to do anything after that band? I just realised that this time 50 years ago, I was in my first band, which was with Renee Geyer. And I was in a Sydney, a band called Dry Red. And 50 years ago, we, were, we, were, we had a residency at a wine bar called The Cask in the Bondi Road in Sydney. So, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> been doing this for 50 years which is kind of an outrageous thought but that's okay yeah. that's good this captain matchbox that was right at the very end of captain matchbox wasn't it? you basically because you know people people uh, probably aren't aware that you weren't an original member of mondo rock you weren't on the uh, first album uh, that's right the whole it was a whole different band uh, there was an album that um, ross made with the first version of mondo rock um, and that album was called primal park and um and uh, after that, Ross decided to start from scratch again and, and got a whole new band. And that was with James Black and with Paul Christie and, and um, uh, Gil Matthews and, and I joined at the, right at the beginning of 1980. I think almost January the 1st, 1980, Ross rang up and offered me the, uh, offered me the gig after I pestered him for a month or two. And I was talking to Mick Conway and he said, yeah, it was weird. We were in Matchbox and we thought, 
gee, this is a really difficult year, but we must be doing something right because Ross Wilson's coming to see us a lot. <laughs> he was just coming to check me out to steal me. So, yeah. Well, he didn't do too bad, did he? Because uh, you were the one that then went on to write uh, State of the Heart, Chemistry, Summer of 81, No Time, The Queen and Me, uh, Come Said the Boy. Come Said the Boy, yeah. Um, that's right. I mean, I was just sort of, I was ready to pop, really, I think, in terms of songwriting. And Ross had had this big purple patch in the early 70s with Daddy Cool, where he just wrote lots and lots of tunes. And I was about, you know, I mean, I'm six years younger than Ross, and I sort of had this sort of, I've been, you know, playing guitar with people like uh, Ross Ryan and John English and Jeff St. John and learning my craft as a guitar player. And then, but I, all the time I'd been writing songs as well. And uh, Mondo Rock was the opportunity for me, you know, because there was such a, you know, a demand for material. I mean, when you get into a band and you do a few albums in a row, the actual, the, the demand for, for material is pretty kind of crazy. And you usually have to write about three times as many songs as actually end up being on the album. So I think I wrote about 25 or 30 songs in 1980 um, to get sort of however many it was I had on the on the chemistry album. It's uh, quite an intensive process. Were any of the songs that you'd written that I'd mentioned, were they written uh, before Mondo Rock? None of those songs were trunk songs, but the so old songwriters call them ones, you know, the ones you just have in your trunk. Um, uh, no, they were all really written if, after the beginning of 1980, yeah. Well, Come Said the Boy was such a, a massive hit that, uh, well, it was now a classic rock hit around Australia. And with the uh, Dream Room, you've actually come up with a sequel to Come Said the Boy and uh, bumping into memories. Now, uh, you know, the original Come Said the Boy was a pretty saucy song, you know, so the sequel is uh, somebody like 30 years on, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it's sort of 30 years on or, 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 or so and, you know, coming back to that sort of same beachside suburb and uh, thinking about, you know, the first love and, and wondering whether to give them a phone call and <laughs> that kind of, that's the, that's the premise of it, yeah. So, uh... um, and, and it's good, it's like, uh, you know, I, I, it's, it's turned out to be one of the best songs on, on the album. I wrote that with a guy called Jake Mason from Cooking on Three Burners. We had a big uh, international hit with a, with a song called This Girl about three or four years ago. Yes, a couple um, of songs Jake, on the album with Jake. Uh, yeah, there's another one called uh, the title song, What the Moon Believes. Yeah, he's a, he, he and I have been writing over the last 10 years quite a lot of stuff. Um, and there's about four or five songs I think I wrote by myself and there's um, a couple I wrote in collaboration with the band and uh, one with a girl called Alicia Beale, who's a very good up-and-coming writer. Yes, uh, most of them are Eric McCusker songs. Uh, the other members, well, uh, let's talk about Hot Sunny Day because you've co-written that one with Fallon Williams. Uh, yeah, Fallon, that was sort of Fallon had that song in a kind of a, you know, half written or uh, two thirds written sort of state. And I just sort of came in and, and kind of, I, I kind of, I'm a good sort of song structuralist and stuff. And so uh, I, it was sort of his idea and he had kind of two out of the three components and I just kind of put it together and shifted around and edited it and added another, another section. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, I, I, I love that song. You know, it's like a very, very simple song really. What about uh, Busy Living then? Because that's the co-write with Nikki. Was that a song Nikki brought to you and you've crafted together? Uh, that that's that's right. Um, it was written about a friend of hers who'd just been given a kind of a rather a, a diagnosis of, um, of a, of a term, terminal illness, and it's sort of been kind of um, uh, kind of wa wasting away in a way, sort of bored with life and everything. And then, oddly enough, when he got the diagnosis, which gave him a couple of years to live, he started doing all the things he should have been doing, you know all along which was you know traveling and enjoying himself and he, and uh, dragging himself out of the funk and he really did make the most of the time that he had left and that's that's what that song is about uh, everybody in the band has collaborated on smack bang uh, does that uh, did, did that happen like it it looks like on paper or everybody in the room at the same time exactly. writing a song it was exactly that we started out we started out with nothing and just started with a bit of music and then someone started yelling out things and Fallon said oh how about a bit that goes da 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 and we also leapt onto it so yeah it absolutely was it was the four of us in the rehearsal room writing that song together 
and kind of wrote it was pretty pretty quick only took a couple of weeks to write it and um it, yeah it's 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 turned out well i think the um, uh, thing that uh, strikes me with uh, What the Moon Believes is the diversity of uh, the songs on this album. Some jazz, some pop, some rock. Uh, is this uh, a reflection of the individual tastes within the band members? Uh, yes, and the fact that we've all just played in lots and lots of different bands and lots of kind of music. Um, to me, it was in sort of inspired by the year 1967, which, you know, is the year I thought was one of the greatest years in music. And in 1967, there was no kind of contradiction between having a song that might be a bit like Burt Backrack and it might be a bit like Jimi Hendrix. You know, those two things seem to coexist. In fact, I tested this uh, a couple of weeks ago where I, I, I Googled Dusty Springfield, Jimi Hendrix. And sure enough, I found a clip of Jimi Hendrix on the Dusty Springfield show duetting on um, Mockingbird, you know. You know the song Mockingbird? The song yeah. Mark Bird, yeah. So Hendrix and Dusty Springfield. Now you think Dusty Springfield is like Burt Backrack, that kind of stuff. And Hendrix, and, and these days you'd almost think those two things were irreconcilable. But in 1967, those things could live together. And uh, and that's the sort of the world I, I like, you know, I dream of where the sort of genre distinctions are not so kind of, people don't worry about it so much. And Mondo Rocks records were kind of like that. You know, one hand you'd have the state of the heart and then you'd have a song like No Time, which is kind of a pretty heavy rock song. So we, we always, uh, there was always that sort of diversity. And to me, there's no kind of contradiction in that. But um, mm. uh, it's like kind of a bit of a range. We've got the uh, the name of the album, uh, What the Moon Believes, the name of the band, The Dream Room. And I guess this is all conjuring up... Uh, a level of cosmic spirituality. Is there a depth to this band uh, over and above, you know, just the music? That's a, that's a very good question. I don't quite know how to answer that. Um, uh, I mean, I, because I, I was sort of thinking about how, how to sort of find some unifying thing. And in a way, we started out with even greater diversity and we did kind of narrow it down. And I just like the way that, that those songs to me are slightly sort of sort of early psychedelic, you know, in 1967 was just when there was still sort of, there was still sort of Georgie fame playing jazzy English Hammond organ sort of st tracks. And yet, and there might be, you know, Burt Backrack with R Dusty Springfield and it was Hendrix just starting out and Pink Floyd was starting out. It was such an exciting time. And I don't know if this is a retro record or not, but, or whether that's just, the, was our inspiration. I mean, I think the, the, uh, a patron saint of this band is Stevie Marriott, and and in in 1967, Stevie Marriott had incredible hits with the, the Small Faces, and uh, yeah, I think there's a sort of a, a touch of inspiration of that, which seems to me the stylistic theme of it. Does that make sense? We, uh, we're we're about to see some live shows uh, for this band uh, now. Apart from the album itself, there's a lot of history with everybody in the band that we've spoken about. Will the history also be recognised uh, live in the set list? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's what, we're get, what we're doing is um, playing a few, we play a few Mondo tracks. We play Summer of 81, we play Come Said the Boy. Um, but we also do, um, we do, we do, we've just learned to play uh, a little bit of Let's uh, oh, Don't Fall in Love by the Ferrets. And we play a couple of Stevie Marriott things. We play a Humble Pie song called Natural Born Boogie and we do Tin Soldier. So because it's a two set show, we thought, OK, well, we'll play some songs that kind of help describe the, the backstory of the members of the band. Well, if Natural Born Boogie's there, I'll be there too. OK, yeah, that's a crazy, that's a good song, isn't it? That was our only hit in Australia, really, uh, Humble Pie. They had lots of hits in America, but that was the only one that was really big here. But, uh, it's a cool yeah. song. Uh, now, Mondo Rock is still a band. You get out and do the shows every now and then, but there hasn't been a new album since 1991. Will there ever be new Mondo Rock music? Good question. I actually don't know. It's um, I, I, I keep bringing it up and everybody just goes, oh, it's like it's sort of the, the idea of making an album is, you know, when you try and you know, I mean, this this Dream Room album took us two years to do. I mean, the second year was the was the COVID year, it was 2020. So that kind of meant that, by fortunately, we'd pretty well finished all the recording by then, and we were able to do the mixing remotely, and add, people were able to add their parts a bit. Uh, Mondo Rock. I mean, I'd love to. I'd love to do another Mondo Rock album. Yeah, I feel I haven't quite said everything that needs to be said in that context. Um, but just as people find it daunting. 
I mean, I was reading an interview with the guys from Steely Dan and they did a, a comeback album and uh, it took them three years to do it. And they said when they started it, there was <laughs> uh, opposite Donald Fagan's place, there was a building site. By the time they finished it, there was a 40 story building. It was full of people already living it. And that was in the time it took them to make the album. So you know, these things take quite a lot of effort. Yeah, well, you've got a precedent. I think uh, the Sex Tape Rock and Roll album by Daddy Cool through to the new Cool album had a 34-year gap. We're currently sitting at a 30-year gap since the last Mondo Rock album, so it does sound like it's about time. Yeah, I think that'd be good. Maybe that's the next thing I do. <laughs> Certainly hope so. Uh, looking forward to seeing the, uh, the Dream Room live. In the meantime, uh, yeah, What the Moon uh, Believes, the album. And... Uh, uh, we're launching at the uh, at the uh, Oakley Lounge on Saturday night. Good to hear and good to see. Eric, thanks for joining us here at Noise 11. Okay, thank you very much, Paul.